Good morning from Stockholm and a warm welcome to this virtual development talks on connecting gender equality and biodiversity for sustainable societies. The seminar is organized by SIDA, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. And my name is Anna Axelsson. Uh, I'm a senior advisor for environment and climate change at SIDA, and I will be moderating the session today. We are here because power relations shape all our lives. They shape how we go about our business, they shape how we treat nature. And biodiversity underpins all of human societies and is crucial for poverty reduction. So as humanity now faces the interconnected and systemic crises of biodiversity loss and climate change, it is inevitable that we also need to revisit power relations, including gender inequalities. So the aim of today's seminar is to connect the dots between what is usually considered two different disciplines, gender on the one hand, biodiversity and environment on the other. And for that purpose, we have gathered prominent experts from government, from civil society and from academia who will reflect on the connections and the role of development cooperation and how grassroots experiences can influence policy making uh, and ensure that the interlinkages are reflected in policy frameworks. We have a full program today. We will start by listening to opening remarks from SIDA's uh, Deputy Director uh, General, Marie Ottosson, and from the State Secretary, uh, Janine Alm Eriksson. They will be followed by keynote addresses from Andrew Norton and Valet Schwutze. And later on in the program, I will introduce two youth activists that have recorded messages for us. And this will be followed by a panel discussion that, where we have four distinguished guests representing four uh, organizations, namely Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, AIPP, and WWF Sweden, Schalmes University in Gothenburg, Sweden, and Swede Bio. And you, the participants in the audience, will have opportunities to engage with us and to ask questions. Um, to the panelists using Menti, which we'll introduce shortly. And you can also use the chat on YouTube. We have a CEDA colleague who is moderating that chat. So if you have practical questions or um, straightforward questions directed at CEDA, you can ask them on YouTube and she will do her best to answer. And she will also share some materials and links connected to what the speakers are, are talking about. So we will also have a short leg stretcher um, about halfway through the program before we go into the Q&A. But first of all, we would like to hear from you in the audience. Um, so I would ask you now to go to menti.com, open a web browser or pick up your phone, go to menti.com and enter the code, which is 4701. 7930. And you should also be able to see this code now on the screen in the bottom right corner. So the first question we'd like you to um, respond to is where are you located? In which city are you right now? So enter the code which is 47017930. And please tell us in which city you are located right now. And it's going to be interesting to see. Um, Uppsala comes up first. You're fast in Uppsala. Uh, where we have people joining from and also how many we are. So as can be expected, we have Stockholm showing up in the middle. Uh, quite a few people joining from there. But I also see several other cities in Sweden, um, from the west coast to the south. And I see Brussels. This is moving quickly. And lots of places. I see Bangkok. And I believe I see London as well. So we have people joining at least from Asia and Europe, which is great to see. I saw Helsinki there really quickly as well.
Well, it's wonderful to see um, that we are people from so many different places interested in this topic and that we are so many also that want to join today and discuss this topic. With that, we're going to move on to our second question. And we would like you to reflect now on what is the main underlying cause to why women are more affected than men by biodiversity loss? And for this question, you have four different options um, and you should be able to move your marker and place it in one of these four squares. So we have patriarchal structures and social norms. We have poverty and marginalization. We have women and girls are seldom involved in decision-making processes and their knowledge is therefore not captured. And we have international commitments on biodiversity does not have a sufficient gender lens. And we see answers starting to come in quite quickly. Someone has put their, their uh, marker in the middle between two different answers. That's uh, often something we want to do when we think many things are, are important. But otherwise, we see a pretty good spread here. Um, And answers are coming in, and it seems that uh, most of you are leaning towards patriarchal structures and social norms, but we have several answers also on women and girls not being involved in decision-making processes. And of course, um, answers reflecting to poverty and marginalization, and also international commitments on biodiversity. And of course, and I see, I think there are 12 answers right in the middle. Uh, a lot of people who want to indicate that I think all of these answers are, are important. And certainly they are. Of course, none of these answers is incorrect. All of these are reasons that women are more affected than men by biodiversity loss. Um, but as many of you have, have chosen uh, to answer, patriarchal structures and social norms underpin uh, the other ones, but all of them are uh, causes to why women are more affected than men by biodiversity loss. And we will be touching on all of these topics throughout the seminar. So with that, I would like to thank you so much uh, for your input and for your commitment and engagement. And then before I introduce the first speaker of today, uh, I would like to encourage you to use social media when communicating from this event. Um, using the hashtags, which you should also now see on the screen, the hashtags are DevTalks and Biodiversity. Now, I would like to introduce um, our first speaker, who is CEDA's Deputy Director General, Marie Ottosson, for her opening remarks on how CEDA connects biodiversity and gender equality. So please, Marie, the screen is now yours. Förlåt, hör ni mig nu då? Förlåt, så mycket för att vi testade i förväg. Men thank you very much, Anna, and let me kick off. Due to gender inequalities, women and girls are disproportionately affected by biodiversity loss and climate change. And today we will discuss what can be done to change that, but also how we can promote more sustainable societies. And I'm very pleased to welcome all of you uh, today, our distinguished speakers, panelists and participants from around the world who are attending <coughs> this virtual development talk on connecting gender equality and biodiversity for sustainable societies. Sustainable ecosystems and biodiversity, they are the foundations of our life on Earth. But our, our biodiversity has been declining at an alarming rate in recent decades, mainly due to human activities. Our ways of using land has changed, pollution has increased, and the climate is changing rapidly. 
And therefore, gender equality is a very important key to advance the work to preserve biodiversity. The majority of women and girls are seldom involved in the decision-making processes. <coughs> Sorry, I'm being allergic to pollen. Um, the girls and women are very seldom involved in decision-making processes and their knowledge is therefore not captured. The ongoing global pandemic has aggravated many of these inequalities. And this is something that we all need to address. During this webinar, we will listen to examples of how women and girls in poor and marginalized communities are agents of change for sustainable development. In CEDA, we are supporting organizations who promote gender equality through environment, biodiversity, and climate change initiatives. And we have seen many good results. For example, economic and political empowerment of rural indigenous women in Guatemala it has resulted in women becoming much more financially independent through agriculture. In Kazakhstan, we have a security grant which was provided through Urgent Action Fund for an environmental rights activist and her family. She was threatened, she was physically attacked for mobilizing the residents to fight, uh, the, uh, to fight against the construction of resort in the territory of a national park. In Uganda, we have the same organization, but providing a grant to establish a committee of 17 female lawyers working for the protections of the right of female environmental reports and women human rights defenders. For the last 20 years now, CEDA has supported a regional organization in Asia to ensure that rural com communities in and near forest have the legal right to use it with a strong focus on the rights of women and minorities. More women are now participating in governing forestry and several interest groups have been created by women. We have a very successful example in Nepal where 30% of the members of the village forestry committees are women. But we are also working with men and boys. We are doing this in close partnership with women and girls to try to transform the unhealthy gender rules and social norms, and also to challenge the patriarchal structures. All of these are very important examples, since our conclusion is that environmental goals are reached, societies are becoming more resilient to climate change when the specific needs and priorities of women and men boys and girls are taking into account in policies, in programs, and in organizations. So in fact, a stronger focus on gender equality contribute to reach both environmental and gender equality objectives. All of this links up to two key international processes this year, the Global Forum for Gender Equality in Mexico and the upcoming follow-up forum of the Beijing platform and agenda for action in Paris. These fora, they will set the stage for accelerating gender equality in the decade of action. But also the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, it is foreseen to be adopted at the 15th conference of parties to the convention on biological Di Di diversity in 2021. This framework sees the empowerment of women and the respect and promotion of their rights as crucial for effective biodiversity conservation. CEDA is actively involved in all of these processes. And during the seminar today, we will learn more of, on the importance of them and how they are interconnected. So finally, once again, I would like to welcome all the participants. I would also like to thank our distinguished speakers and panelists. And I am so eager and I'm so much looking forward to today to hear about new ideas, new ways of collaborating, and also new recommendations on how to further connect gender equality and biodiversity to take this work forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marie for uh, those remarks, for framing the issue that we're going to be discussing today. 
We will move directly to our second uh, opening remark. And I am so pleased to introduce the State Secretary to the Minister for International Development Cooperation at the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ms. Janine Alm Eriksson, who will um, give her opening remarks on the Swedish priorities on these issues. So please, the screen is now yours. Thank you, Anna. Our planet is in a state of emergency. A climate crisis bringing an increasing number of tropical storms, floods, wildfires and droughts. A biodiversity crisis with an accelerating extinction of species, raising sharp questions about how our livelihoods depend on our relationship with nature. It's an inequality crisis exacerbated by the socio-economic effects of the global pandemic, dispro disproportionately affecting those who are already most vulnerable. A gender equality crisis with a global gender gap widening due to the pandemic. This is here and now and not in a distant future. We see the effects around the world today. And if we fail to address these interlinked crises, we will see more hunger, new pandemics, greater injustice and marginalization, more conflicts and forced migration. We need an urgent transition to fossil free economies. We need ambitious recovery programs with human rights and gender perspective that lift the disadvantaged and set us on track to a redefined relationship with the biosphere. And we need to ensure global action. This is the time for more cooperation and more determination. This is also the time to once and for all leave the silo thinking behind. Clean air, arable land, living oceans, wetlands and forests, as well as stable climate conditions are the building blocks of our existence and the human condition. Biodiversity and healthy ecosystems are at the basis of sustainable development and poverty reduction. And we cannot get there without having human rights, gender equality, women's and girls' empowerment, the foundation of a world that is fair and equal as our guide. Sweden's commitment to the 2030 agenda, our feminist foreign policy, our drive for democracy, our prioritization of climate financing, and our new biodiversity initiative all comes down to this. So how do we address the ongoing disastrous loss of biodiversity? Well, the answer to that question is complex and contextual. The global biodiversity framework to be adopted in Kunming in October this year must provide a robust international commitment and plan of action for transformative change. We need to collectively agree on what it entails to be Kunming compliant. And one thing is clear, the knowledge of women take us a long way in identifying and scaling up more sustainable ways of responding to the human quest for food and materials. This valuable resource must not be only be at the table, but put to use. And this is one of many reasons why the challenges of today must be addressed in a way that acknowledges how they are interlinked. The human pressure on wildlife will breed the next pandemic. Acidic oceans will not feed growing human populations, and degraded land will not provide protection against the effects of climate change. Women environmental activists being sidelined, threatened or killed represents not only grave violations to their human rights, but that of the generations to come. And we must turn this around. On the road ahead, an integrated approach is not a burden, but an investment in a green and fair future. Not only is it desirable, it is inevitable. We will create opportunities and improve well-being for both people and planet. And we can do this as we speak. Degraded land is being restored to provide sustainable production. Local communities are finding new solutions to live in harmony with nature. Governments commit to new emission targets. Businesses realize that their future must be fossil free and nature positive. Vaccines are being administered. Voices of young people are having an impact. A strong global feminist movement 
is paving the way. And transformative change is not out of reach. As we move forward, the bar needs to be raised even higher. We must expect a lot of ourselves and of each other. Building momentum, sharing ideas, learning and innovating. That is what we are here to do today and every day. And then to go out there together and act. And this, this is our chance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janine Alm Eriksson, for those valuable remarks, and thank you for ending on a note of hope. It should be clear that this is now the political backdrop against which we're discussing these issues, and it's clear, I think, that both gender equality and biodiversity are top priorities for the Swedish government and also for Swedish Development Corporation. But after this introduction, it's now time to move to our keynote speakers. First, we are going to listen to Andrew Norton, who is the director of the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED, a research institute and a long-term partner to CEDA, which is based in the UK. IIED's current strategy uh, focuses on five interlinked crises, the climate crisis, the biodiversity loss, inequality, urban risk and unsustainable markets. So Andrew is well placed to address today's topic. They also work together with a wide range of partners from across the world, from grassroots organizations to the least developed countries group in the UNFCCC climate negoci negotiations. So Andrew, you will highlight the critical role that biodiversity plays and how conservation policy can promote gender equality, as well as addressing the role of international policy frameworks. So please, Andrew, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Anna, and also a huge thanks to the State Secretary and Marie Ottesen for those inspiring opening remarks as well. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, the talk is about gender and biodiversity. I'm going to attempt to give a kind of fairly broad overview at this point. Um, so biodiversity is the variability and variety of life on Earth. Um, at the genetic species and ecosystem level. Um, and biodiversity globally is in trouble. The authoritative IPBES 2019 review of biodiversity and ecosystems found that 25% or 1 million plant and animal species worldwide were at risk of extinction, some within, uh, within a few decades. Um, when talking about biodiversity loss in this talk, I'm referring at the local scale with an assumption that slowing, halting and reversing biodiversity loss at that scale are all possible. At the global scale, certain kinds of biodiversity loss, particularly species, of course, are not reversible. It's one reason why this crisis is so important. Um, and to date, this has been treated as an environmental problem predominantly in the global debates. But the biodiversity crisis is also a development crisis. Biodiversity loss threatens to undermine hard-won development gains in all kinds of fields, health, resilience, food security, and so on. But poor people are particularly dependent on biodiversity, both to meet day-to-day -day livelihood needs and also to enhance resilience to climate change and other threats. Um, a few words about the global frameworks. Um, the CBD was mentioned in the introductory talks. That's a multilateral treaty which dates the Rio Earth Summit and has three main goals. Uh, conservation of biodiversity, sustainable use of its components, and critically, fair and equitable sharing of benefits. Um, and at COP15 in October, which has also already been mentioned, the international community will agree a new 10-year strategy for biodiversity management. And ensuring that this works for both biodiversity and for people requires coordinated thinking and action. And it really is time for the development community as a whole to focus on this more than it maybe has done in the past. Um, a few words now about how to analyze gender inequality in relation to biodiversity. And I've used in this talk, uh, Caroline Moses' influential gender planning framework. Um, which is based on a distinction between practical gender needs and interests, um, things like access to housing, water and education. 
um, which can be met without challenging gender norms or gender power, and strategic needs and interests which relate to power and control, and if these are met, then existing power relations are challenged. Um, I've also used a contrast between a static framing for looking at biodiversity loss and the impact on gender, um, which looks at the Im implications of declining biodiversity for men and women, and then a dynamic framing that looks at policy responses to declining biodiversity and the implications for men and women and for structures of gender power. So taking the static framing, if we want to look at the impacts of biodiversity loss on well-being by gender, um, these are highly context specific, but they are fairly general in certain respects. So, for example, um, women's responsibilities in the gender division of labour mean that um, they are affected by gather, you know, growing biodiversity loss in relation to um, tasks such as gathering fuel, wood, uh, food, minor product, forest products and medicines, and this can have a broad impact on livelihoods and income. But also indirectly ecosystem stewardship um, may also help with water accessibility. This is a critical issue for the labour work burden of women and particularly girls, so likely to have a significant impact on girls' access to schooling, for example. Um, and if we look at policy responses to biodiversity loss, and there were some excellent examples in Murray Otterson's talk, um, you know, if gender policies and projects, conservation and biodiversity policies and projects can kind of take either an approach that focuses um, more of a kind of women in development kind of approach that doesn't look at power relations, but can also look at gender transformative approaches and ways that aim through projects to shift power dynamics. Um, and a couple of examples here, um, much in the news is the idea that public policy could support employment for ecosystem stewardship and the protection of nature. We've seen this in the huge employment guarantees uh, program in India, um, but it's also coming into developed countries through things like the Biden administration's proposal for a climate conservation court. And these can be geared to increasing women's income, but also to have empowerment effects depending on how they're designed and implemented. And there is the critical issue as well in terms of action of natural resource rights and attention to strengthening women's rights to natural resources is a major possible win in conservation and, bio, and biodiversity projects and policy. Um, they can also, if ignored, um, be damaging. Um, and there is an example here where um, if incentives are created for land grabs which disadvantage women, then conservation and biodiversity action can also have very negative impacts on women's both strategic and practical gender needs. Um, a few words also about other intersectionality issues that relate. That 2019 IPBES review, I mentioned one of its key findings was that lands managed by indigenous peoples experience markedly less biodiversity loss than other areas, and this is a critical finding. And across many indigenous cultures, women play a key role in the intergenerational transmission of indigenous knowledge and in maintaining agro-biodiversity. But male out-migration is increasingly burdening women and threatening this role in many contexts. So what can we say about gender and biodiversity in the global fra frameworks? Well, the CBD actually has quite a good record comparatively of seeking to take gender issues on board. Um, it first appeared in CBD issue um, decisions in 1996. Um, and the CBD um, was the first convention to have a gender action plan. But the challenge has been that many of the references to gender are kind of high level principles that refer to issues of recogni recognition and procedure. There is less detail on issues of distributional equity and less practical detail on what needs to be done to improve gender equality on the ground and the interaction with actions to protect and conserve biodiversity. So a few very quick words on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which is still in draft. It has some good elements, a call for appropriate recognition of gender equality. Target 20 um, encourages equitable participation in decision making um, by gender, but by other, other dimensions as well. 
Um, and gender equality is listed as an enabling condition for implementation of the framework. But it's still not sufficiently clear, we would argue, about the practical implications. Certain areas where it could be strengthened. Um, gender disaggregated analysis of the value of nature's contribution to people, which is an element of the framework, could be advocated and incorporated into planning. Um, the distributional elements could be more clearly addressed, for example, in benefit sharing from the distribution of the benefits from genetic resources. Um, and perhaps most critically, this 70% target that's got a huge amount of, sorry, 30% target that's got a huge amount of international attention about putting 30% of the world aside, basically to be nature positive. It is really critical that this is done in ways that are pro-people, but also um, take full account of gender equality as well. There is a risk that this target is interpreted in ways that are fundamentally saying we're going to move the people out that can have massively damaging implications, particularly for women who are unlikely to get compensation for land. So how that target is critical. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are various other things I could say, but we're moving towards the end now. So let me just highlight um, finally um, that we have drafted at IID three guides for CBD negotiators. Um, I think these are up on our website now. If they're not, they will be um, imminently within a day or two. Um, the first one of these focuses on how to strengthen equity considerations across the full framework. Um, and the third is looking at the foundational elements of the framework and highlights how and where these can be strengthened to support the transformational change that is implied in the draft goals and targets. So thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to address you. And I'm looking forward very much to the rest of the seminar. Thank you so much, Andrew, for those very valuable remarks. You have really set the scene for the rest of, of the conversation we're going to have here today. So thank you. So I'd like to move directly now to our second keynote speaker, who is Violet Shivutze. Uh, Violet Shivutze is the elected chair of the Hawaii Commission's Governing Council and also Africa Regional Representative. She's also the director of the Shibuya Community Health Workers in Kakamega, Kenya. And Violet is a long-time advocate for including grassroots communities and especially grassroots women's perspective in policymaking and also for connecting the Beijing platform and the Convention on Biodiversity. So Violet, you will speak to us about the interlinkages between um, women's empowerment, gender equality and biodiversity. Uh, and you will update us on the status quo of relevant policy processes. So, Violet, please, the uh, screen is now yours. Thank you so much. Um, I hope I'm clear. Okay, thank you. So, um, I am a grassroots woman leader uh, from Kakamega County in the Western region of Kenya. And uh, I am a farmer and also an organizer for grassroots women, as uh, uh, you have uh, clearly heard from the uh, speaker on um, my titles. I just want to say that uh, uh, as grassroots women, uh, the issues of biodiversity have not just begun uh, now. Uh, we all know uh, about Wangare Madai from Kenya, who was really um, took a lot of leadership uh, when we were going to the first Beijing meeting uh, to uh, start even interrogating government and holding them accountable on issues of uh, forest encroachment and destruction, mass destruction of indigenous trees in Kenya. So I want to say that uh, as um, women, the issue of biodiversity really concerns us, partly as people that are associated with care of our community. So care for, uh, care for environment just becomes part of our role. Uh, I will give an example of how Shibuya community health workers began working on uh, uh, issues of biodiversity before I open my slides. In 1999, Kenya was struck with a huge, uh, very big pandemic of HIV AIDS. And uh, as a caregiver that had just come on board and we had founded this organization, 
we realized that one important element that we would use to address HIV was to ensure food security at household level. When we started uh, uh, on working on food security and nutrition, we were faced with a very big challenge of climate change. Our soils were degraded and uh, it was so hard to work on food security because most of the farmers went into uh, looking for fertilizer every time they wanted to plant. And for us, who really believed in indigenous food, in food that was able to increase nutrients very quickly, increase the blood levels, I think we didn't want to go that way. We wanted to farm the way our grandmothers were farming. So if you open my slides, I'll be able to share how we began working on this. First slide. When you look at this, uh, these are grassroots women who are doing beekeeping. And these were women who are living across the forest. I didn't mention that I am three kilometers from the forest area of Kakamega County. This is the biggest tropical forest that has been encroached for a very long time until women took the measure of identifying areas that have been crushed and planting trees. Uh, when you look at the second slide, which is really relates to this. Second slide. This is a woman who lives along the forest who has done a very big tree nursery in her home. She also does it in a group. And this is what she reflects, replicates in her own home. We did this because we wanted to take leadership in protection of this forest because the forest was being managed by men and the men were using this as an advantage to cut trees, to lie us with companies and completely destroy the forest. Now that the women are involved in tree planting and the perspective of culture that women cannot plant trees has been challenged because women are planting trees in groups and organizing big tree planting days. This has been changed and now women are leading and championing. And this does not just look at issues of encroached forest. The beekeeping is now a very big livelihood for grassroots women living along the forest. We have a lot of honey that is coming and we transport it to Nairobi, the capital city, to pharmaceutical companies that the women are producing. The next slide. The other issue that we were faced uh, was issue of degraded land. When you look at this, this is one of our learning sites. In between, you can see tomatoes. This land has really been degraded, but now the women have used mulching uh, by the maize stalks and uh, putting compost manure to ensure this land will be rehabilitated and continues to become land for agriculture. This, in this land, it is a place where uh, this demonstration site does not just teach soil rehabilitation alone, but it also teaches women on doing livelihood activities that are related to uh, land and biodiversity. The next slide. This is also another portion of irrigative land or near the lake region, which is also being done by grassroots women in a place that has been degraded the soil. When you look at the terraces at the back, the soil was going to the lake and the land was really becoming degraded. The women have managed this land and now it's their livelihood for, for vegetable. And they are selling huge amount of vegetable from this. The next slide. That is a slide that shows an area where land was a very big issue. Women could not access land because it was believed that customary land does not belong to women. When women started doing soil rehabilitation activities, uh, reclaiming the land that was really degraded and rehabilitating this land, the women are now perceived as change agents and they are selling huge amount of vegetable from this land, which is both for their livelihood and also transforming the community to show the importance of women accessing land. These women would go to the lake every day to get fish so that they are able to have livelihood. And they would get like three fish, which is not adequate to feed a family or even to sell. But now when they went into agriculture, 
we started this as an alternative livelihood from fishmongering, but now this is the most uh, thrilling livelihood now in Homer Bay County, where HIV has been a very big pro problem and food security has been enhanced. The next slide. When we look at this slide, this is a slide that is a peer exchange. And this peer exchange is between government. This is not peer exchange between grassroots women. It's between government and grassroots women in Siaya County, where grassroots women are training government on the importance of soil rehabilitation after going around. This is when they post for this picture. So uh, I'll go back to my presentation without PowerPoint on how the grassroots women have actually functioning as agents of change in issues of biodiversity. Things that have hindered women like accessibility to land and control. Right now, we have a bill that we have forwarded to the county assembly where we have come up with um, community-driven land lease guidelines that now we have used and we have seen that success of women who cannot be able to access land through inheritance. They can be able to lease land or access land through other means that the county has not put a policy that advances issues like land leasing. Now we gave this policy document to the county government. It's not in our hands. The county is really happy that they are going to deliver this policy for small scale farmers to be able to access land through land leasing. The grassroots women have participated in soil uh, developing soil protection policy which is now a national policy that will be passed very soon in the National Assembly that was really informed by the experience of grassroots women on the importance of sustainable land use, in including the issues of soil rehabilitation as a core element in that area. So what I want to say is that the grassroots women are actually embracing this through our resilient activities we are able to position biodiversity at the center of our work, sit and develop work plans. And our work plans now are not just informing uh, ourselves, but we also share our work plans with county government and other NGOs. Right now, my organization, Shibuye, when we had a GIZ came to Kakamega to work on issues of soil rehabilitation, they were referred to us directly as the resource people that understand issues of soil rehabilitations. And we are now championing uh, soil rehabilitation activities with other, other partners like GIZ, TMG Berlin, and in our work in resilience that is funded by CETA, which was the backbone of this work that we have been doing, we are doing on soil uh, rehabilitation on, on resilience. I also want to share, share that when you look at this work, the grassroots women have been recognized by the government. What is remaining is how to formalize the relationship between grassroots women and government and other development partners in programming and being able to give a way forward in informing how biodiversity activities have to be implemented. As a grassroots women, when I hear about gender equality, which I like very much, but the issues that really are specific in how we describe women empowerment in issues of diversity should be made very specific. Violet, I will have to ask you to uh, wrap up, please. Okay, thank you. So I was saying that it will be very important for us to really have specific indicators that measure women empowerment in issues of gender equality and biodiversity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Violet. Thank you for that valuable contribution. And thank you to both Violet and Andrew for setting the scene for the panel discussion we're going to have. You framed the issue in terms of, um, of biodiversity, in terms of development, and you've also touched on important aspects for both how both policy and practical work play a role in connecting gender and biodiversity. And both Violet and Andrew will stay with us, so if you have questions for them, you can use Menti uh, to post those questions and we'll bring them up in the Q&A after the panel um, discussion. 
So, we'll now move on to two messages from youth activists. They are here to remind us about the urgency of the interconnected crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change and how gender equality plays a critical role to address them. So, we're going to listen to Shohana Rahman from Bangladesh, who is the leader of the Fridays for Future uh, in Bangladesh, and to Amelia Aregin, who is the regional coordinator for the Latin America and Caribbean uh, of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. Both of them have recorded messages for us, and we're going to start by listening now to Amelia Arguin in Mexico. We, the youth, say enough. Enough of behavior that it is harmful to biodiversity and people, where women and girls are always the most affected. Enough of short-term, quick fixes that do not address our deep socio-environmental crisis, particularly both women and biodiversity exploitation. Living in harmony with nature requires a real transformative change that puts an end to extractivism, extinction, colonialism, poverty and gender-based violence. Let us reinvent all of our systems, particularly the economic and the political ones. Let put in their core humans and nature's rights. In this, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework has a lot to say. That's why we demand that it includes women and girls' rights to land, to water, to health, access to information and education, participation and leadership in decision-making, access to justice and a fair and equitable benefit sharing. Thank you, Amelia, for those strong words. And we will now turn our eyes towards Bangladesh and we will listen to Shohana Rahman, the leader of the Fridays for Future in Bangladesh. Hello, my name is Shohan Rahman. I am from Bangladesh. I am the coordinator of Youth Net for Climate Justice, the largest youth movement in Bangladesh and founding member of Fridays for Future, who is leading by Geta Thunberg. Violence against nature and the women is a demonstration of patriarchal domination, who is, is become a pandemic to our time. Patriarchy, colonialism, capitalism and destructive masculinity is the root causes for this planetary emergencies, which create more, more uh, ecological and biodiversity losses. So all are interconnected and it's intersectional because we cannot achieve climate justice without gender justice and we cannot achieve gender justice without climate justice. So we must focus on the masculinity and more women engagement for the natural conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Shoanur, and thank you, Amelia. And I would like to thank you not only for your contribution today, but also for your relentless work uh, working for biodiversity, climate and gender equality in your respective contexts. Thank you. It is time to move to our panelists. We have four knowledgeable speakers with us today who are going to share experiences and, and perspectives on both emerging evidence and promising approaches from development cooperation, from uh, academic research and from policy development on how to connect the issues of gender equality and biodiversity. And we will also hear about the status quo and opportunities for more systemic approaches in global policy processes on these issues. And our panelists today are Prague Rai from the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, AIPP, and Martin Hultmann from Chalmers University in Gothenburg, Sweden. It is Lisa Albrandt from WWF Sweden and Panilla Malmer from Swedbio. So a warm welcome to all of you to see the development talks. We're really grateful and thankful to have you with us today. Um, before we go to the first speaker, I would like to inform you in the audience that you have the chance to post questions to the panelists and also to Violet and Andrew, as I mentioned before. And you can do that using Menti. So if you uh, again go to menti.com and use the same code as before, um, 4701 7930, 
you should also see this code on the screen now, uh, you can submit your questions and we will address as many as we can after uh, the panel presentations. And if you have a question directed at a particular person, please include the name of that person in your question. Um, so, time to move to our first speaker on the panel, who is Pragya Rai from AIPP. Uh, you are the Indigenous Women's Program Coordinator at AIPP, and you have worked with programs that address gender equality and biodiversity uh, in Indigenous communities in Nepal and the Asia regions for many years. AIPP is a partner to SIDA, and you will tell us about Indigenous women's connection to biodiversity and also how you work to strengthen their roles as um, as agents of biodiversity protection. So Pragya, over to you. Pragya? Do yeah, we have hi. Do we have Pragya with us? Yes. Great. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Anna, for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, greetings, everyone present and also participating online. I'm Pragya Rai from Rai Indigenous Community in Nepal. Currently, I'm working as the Indigenous Women's Program Coordinator at Asia Indigenous People Pact, AIPP in short. Next slide, please. So AIPP is a regional organization promoting and defending indigenous people's rights movement since 1992. AIPP at present has 46 members from 14 countries in Asia. Next. As per the World Resource Institute, it is estimated that 65% of global land area is inhabited by indigenous peoples. Indigenous communities mostly live in or nearby forest and are highly dependent on the natural resources. Next. It is also estimated that 260 million indigenous peoples live in Asia, and it is safe to estimate that 50% are indigenous women. As the daily practitioners and knowledge holders, lives of indigenous women in Asia are extremely connected to natural resources and biodiversity. In our collaboration with organizations like CEDA has researched and documented several evidences that shows how the nature and biodiversity is physically, socially, economically, and spiritually connected with indigenous peoples, especially indigenous women. In the next slide, I would like to share such one case. Next. In Karen tribe of Thailand, a ritual is practiced every time a child is born. The birth ritual is called Deepa Tu. After the baby is born, its umbilical cord, along with the placenta, is placed into a bamboo box and then tied to a Next, although a ritual, this process contributes to forest preservation and shows how indigenous connected to the nature as soon as they are born. In the Karen script, you can see they have a saying: "Live with the forest, like the forest." Next. Similarly, there's another ritual from the same tribe called Sweeti Ani, uh, by, uh, the Karen tribe again, where they started a demarcated fish, uh, fish sanctuary 10 years ago after some outsiders electrocuted and wiped out all the fishes in May Wang waterway. They also released the fishes regularly to the waterway only after expressing gratitude and asking for forgiveness and blessings. Next. This is the picture of the Karen community performing the ritual before releasing the 
which is taken in one of the APP's field work. Not only are the indigenous communities practicing the bi biodiversity preservation since generations, but we have also responded to the global crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic with indigenous knowledge and skills. Next slide. Mahua flowers found in India, mainly consumed by indigenous communities. It was um, traditionally used to make liquor. In the midst of shortage in ethanol to fight off COVID-19, indigenous women in Chhattisgarh, India, use their indigenous knowledge of alcohol distillation process to produce herbal sanitizers from the same flowers. The case shared are that corroborate the fact that, next slide, Indigenous women are the key holders of traditional knowledge on natural resource and biodiversity management. We are the protectors of forests, natural resources, and biodiversity. Since indigenous women's lives and their daily work is intimately intertwined, they are often the first to discover threats of destruction to the biodiversity. We are also the transmitters of culture and knowledge, and we are our own strong advocates for our rights. As uh, you may have known that indigenous women have been fighting illegal logging and deforestation, as well as having dialogues with government and private companies in many countries like India and the Philippines. Next slide. Today in this platform, I would like to call upon the support from the development corporations to collaborate with indigenous peoples organizations, especially indigenous women, to preserve, promote, and use indigenous women's knowledge, skills, technology, innovation, and customary practices of forest, water, and pasture-based livelihoods, to transfer in economic activities, and to stop criminalization. We really need stronger support to stop criminalization for practicing our indigenous skills. We also uh, call upon the support to indigenous women to transfer indigenous knowledge of nature-based solutions to the climate crisis, and to promote mandatory and meaningful representation and participation of indigenous peoples, especially indigenous women at all levels. Looking at the evidences, it is proven that indigenous peoples, especially indigenous women, are the key agents to address biodiversity loss and to create sustainable societies. Next slide. With this, at the end, I would like to thank CEDA for this opportunity and their continuous support to Indigenous peoples' advancement and to APP member organizations who have been tirelessly working to promote Indigenous peoples' movement. I'd like to end my presentation here with the quote uh, from Vandana Shiva. We moved to wisdom to knowledge, and now we're moving from knowledge to information. And that information is so partial that we're creating incomplete human beings. I look forward to the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pragya, for those really interesting contributions. And also thanks for pushing through despite some, some uh, troubles with the connection for you. We're glad that you, that you could stay with us despite some uh, troubles in the beginning. Thank you. So we will continue now with our second panelist, who is Martin Hultman uh, from Chalmers University in Gothenburg, Sweden. Martin is an associate professor in science, technology and environmental studies. And he is particularly known for his work on masculinities in relation to environment and climate change. So Martin, um, what would you say? I'm, I'm going to ask you now, ba based on your research results, what would you say that we need to do in order to enable a gender equal uh, societal transformation that deals with both the biodiversity and the climate crises? Over to you, Martin. Yeah, a short answer to that it would be that we need to change uh, the masculinities and the behaviors of those men that are at the top of the pyramid first, because they are the main perpetrators of the emissions and also leaders of those organizations and companies that are uh, affecting uh, the biodiversity and uh, 
uh, our planet the most. Um, and in combination with that, I do think that we need to change in laws also, making it impossible actually to uh, destroy the earth as we are doing. But um, that was a short, short summary maybe of my research and, and my um, talk here. Um, but I want to thank the organizers for bringing us together at this decisive time in history. And I want to recognize the countless ecofeminist research projects led by, among else, Professor Seymour Roy Johnson, Andrea Nightingale and Sheila McGregor, which has shown that gender stereotypes and gender imbalances make possible extractive behaviors against nature and in the long run destroy communities living with nature. Such studies have traditionally been carried out in the global south and the policy response have been to empower girls and women, but little to no research or policy has been focusing on male norms. Secondly, the ecocidal logic at the end of Manthropocene the period in which a small group of men thought they could rule the world, must in my analysis come to an end if we are to deal with the powerful feedback loops of biodiversity loss and climate emergency. Masculinity studies expose male violence against women as well as craft educations and policies stopping such behavior. But male norms and structures making possible violence against nature has been less analyzed. When combining the insights from these two research traditions, ecofeminist research and masculinity studies, as well as recognizing the research gap in between them, enter my own scholarship. So my scholarship and collaboration with civil society has exposed the need for and possibility of changing male norms as a solution for the grand challenges we are in the, in the midst of. A large group of persons uh, enacting industrial breadwinner masculinities, uh, they most explicitly um, uh, are shown among those who turn against women-led climate justice movements and indigenous-led rights of nature movements around the globe. In the hate speech and threats against Greta Thunberg and Fridays for Futures and murders of environmental movement leaders, Industrial breadwinner enactments show their toxic face. But as we know from the pyramid of violence against women, this is only the top of a much larger fossil fuel patriarchal system. The other form of masculinities I've researched is the greenwashed eco modern masculinities, men who recognize the challenges we are facing, but with every possible technique try to avoid system changes. Elon Musk is a person who poses as an environmental hero but in various ways use end of pipe technologies to conserve the transportation systems and use all of his surplus from Tesla operations to find ways to departure from the burned out earth in a spaceship, leaving the rest of us behind. But inspired by my engineer colleagues at Chalmers perhaps, who often talks about solutions, sometimes even before they have identified the real problems, I concluded from my historical research and contemporary empirical studies that much larger and deeper change in values and enactments are needed among men. This is what me and Paul Poulet call ecological masculinities. And we have brought this to a leadership training that called Men in the Climate Crisis together with the Swedish pro-feminist organization, Men. It's an evidence-based series of eight reflective meetings that we have created in which participants are encouraged to embrace the severity of the ongoing global ecological crisis, express feelings about it, reflect on their role in ecological degradation and find diverse ways to contribute to positive change. The groups in Sweden, Russia, Italy and US and with digital means from all around the world have explored how to choose reciprocity and care in the making of an equal and sustainable world without violence. The leadership training is codified in a handbook free to download and test. And a couple of additional pedagogical tools are under development, such as a deck of card, cartoons, and pictures. And an assessment is available as the chapter when gender equality and earth care meet ecological masculinities in the practice, free to download, read, and share. Are you ready uh, to, to wrap up, Martin? Yeah. 
Currently, you. you're all invited to participate in a series of meetings organized by Men Engage in the Ubuntu seminar uh, exposed on this flyer. Finally, these challenges are neither a gender issue or even a masculinity challenge alone, but it's my judgment that our work with changing norms and practices connected to dominant forms of masculinities, industrial, mass, modern, and eco-modern, could make a difference as a gender transformative solution for addressing our situation. But this change cannot happen in isolation and needs to go with fast transformation in power, laws, wealth, and values, thereby leaving fossil fuels in the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, uh, for that valuable perspective, really. We'll move quickly on to our third panel speaker, who is Lisa Ahlbrandt from WWF Sweden. And Lisa, you are a gender expert in one of Sweden's or Sweden's and probably the world's most prominent conservation organization. And you are working to ensure that WWF Sweden's CEDA funded work in Africa and Southeast Asia is carried out with a gender perspective. So Lisa, if you could tell us about the main challenges that you face uh, in when it comes to integrating gender in the conservation work and how you are working to overcome these challenges. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. And the uh, WWS vision is a world where people live in harmony with nature. So we need to and we want to uh, work with gender equality to reach our conservation goals. So as uh, as you ask them, which are the challenges, which are strategies, and which are some results that we see? Well, there is sometimes a resistance uh, and an identity crisis when an organization has been working for a long time with one thing and then needs to include more issues. And in relation to gender, sometimes we get the world culture coming up as something very difficult and very fixed, something that makes us uh, passive if we say, oh, it's culture. There's not much we can do, sorry, we have to leave. So what should we do and what can we do? Well, to overcome resistance at organizational level, we are working a lot to understand both the linkages between gender and bi biodiversity and both ways. And also uh, working a lot to understand that gender equality is always a goal in itself and uh, uh, an important human rights issue for everyone to work with. We also think it's very important to break down the culture, the cultural challenges, and understand that culture, tradition, religion, structure, systems are very interlinked, uh, cannot be separated, and that they are constantly changing um, thanks to and due to inner and outer uh, questioning. Uh, so our partner offices around the world and our CSO partners are working more and more to reach deep level transformative change by taking practical smaller steps. Uh, for example, training for men on gender equality issues and gender roles, training for women on leadership, public speaking and practical meeting techniques and management, involvement of traditional leaders as assets and possible allies in work with values. And to challenge norms in a good and sen sensitive way, and we need to listen, like really listen to both women and men, sometimes together, but often also listen to men and then to women, uh, or the other way around. Uh, for example, in Namibia, we had a consultant there and she asked, why not more women are working as rangers? The men answered that women don't want to, they don't apply for the jobs, they're not strong enough, it's too dangerous for them. But then the women answered that we do want this job, we apply for these jobs, we, we, we're just not allowed to come to the interviews even. So our problems are not that we're not strong enough, the problems are men's attitudes and practical hindrances like there are no uniforms for us or there are no toilets uh, where we work. So the efforts should tackle, of course, men's attitudes and those practical hindrances. So break it down and see where we can tackle the issues. We also want to lift the knowledge and the wisdom from community level to policy and research level to go from grassroots level up. So now we have commissioned a consultant, Joni Seeger, 
who is working on two reports and guidelines for how to integrate gender in global and regional strategies for illegal wildlife trade and ranger work. Because often these uh, strategies, agreements and conventions are gender blind, although the drivers for both poaching and violence in the ranger workforce are clearly linked to masculinity norms. And this puts both men themselves and others at risk. Even though evidence shows that women in rangering bring in, uh, makes it more effective because they bring in other negotiation skills. They have other kinds of relations and community. Even though we know that only 7.5% of the global workforce are women. So let me end by um, a nice result from engaging women in men's work. It relates very much to what Violet said. So that is, uh, was nice to see. Um, the women in uh, Ankameva village in Madagascar have formed an association for mangrove restoration. They have um, restored 121 hectares in five years. And in this case, it's very clear to see that the women are truly needed as workers in the workforce because many men have migrated and uh, many of them are also out further and longer at sea every day because they have to go further out and stay longer due to decreasing uh, fish stock, which is also in turn related to the mangrove, uh, <coughs> man uh, cutting down on mangrove trees. It's also very clear that women's knowledge is greatly needed because it's the women who practice fishing on foot, means this standing up fishing in the deltas. So they are the ones who immediately see when there is a lack of shrimps and crabs uh, due to mangrove destruction. Fiadama, one uh, woman from the association says, it is our own men from the village that cut down the trees. As wives and mothers, we have a duty to convince them to stop. We are women of influence. We are as good as men. And that is why we are taking things into our own hands. So it's very clear that there are women's uh, empowerment results as well as restored mangroves and nature conservation results. So it's a clear win-win situation for us to work more integrated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, uh, for that really interesting and very hands-on contribution um, showing us how the work is done in practice. So we are moving on now to our fourth speaker, who is Pernilla Malmer from SwedeBio. And SwedeBio is a subsidia supported program at the Stockholm Resilience Center. And you, Pernilla, you are a senior advisor on issues related to biodiversity and ecosystem services in development cooperation as well as policy development. And you are a longtime member of the Swedish delegation to the um, Convention on Biodiversity. So, um, you can you tell us a little bit about how and why women's uh, movements and organizations are important in global policy work and, and in general a little bit about the policy work in this area? Panila, over to you. Much. And I think that this seminar has really illustrated that biodiversity is not a narrow issue. It's rather the opposite. Biodiversity is everywhere. It's everything you need in life. It's the grass and the flowers under your feet, the food you eat, the clothes you're wearing. And thanks to biodiversity, you can enjoy rich soil and clean water. Another characteristic of biodiversity is that it's place-based, connected to land. For nurturing biodiversity, you need knowledge, particularly locally-based knowledge and access to land. Women are custodians of biodiversity all over the world. They are um, nurturing it for their families, for their livelihoods. Women are defenders of their lands and territories. And there is an urgent need to give women recognition and access to and ownership of their lands and to ensure recognition of their knowledge, practices and innovations in biodiversity governance that is so intimately linked to the land. Uh, I have in my work the favor to meet many of these women constantly engaged in action to protect their biodiversity and rights. They do so at local level 
but also in international fora. Within the Convention on Biological Diversity, there is a network for women organizations, Women for Biodiversity, that connect their experiences and put forward the proposal for global biodiversity policy decision on biodiversity. I wanted to show you this sample of picture from the last year, it was possible to travel, that shows that it's both governance and practical things and high level meeting. And by the way, the CBD Secretariat, uh, Secretary General, Elizabeth Maruma Morena is a Tanzanian woman. Uh, partnerships are extremely important to the work on the ground for these women groups and movements to strengthen their resilience and enabling building pathways for change. The Women and Environment section of the Beijing 1995 platform for action was visionary since it was one of the first official documents on women's rights that included environmental issues. It even included a recognition of women, women's knowledge on biodiversity. The Beijing Platform for Action also highlighted that environmental degradation produced intersectional and differentiated impact, a fact unfortunately still valid 25 years later. How can policies then for biodiversity protection be better suited to women's needs and the critical roles as biodiversity custodians and environmental rights defenders? Well, when the CBD now is working on a plan to realizing the vision of living in harmony with nature in, um, in 2020, 2050, women are instrumental as agents for change. Andrew mentioned initially that the CBD has a gender plan of action, which is now going through a process of updating in tandem with the development of the new global biodiversity framework. Both the post-2020 framework and the gender plan of action need to integrate gender responsive elements and indicators, including funding in pursuit of human rights of women, girls, men, men and boys, to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. The three main aims of the proposed updated gender plan would be to ensuring equal access to ownership and control over biological resources, including land, and ensuring equal access to benefits from nature and biodiversity, including livelihoods and employment, food and nutrition, security, health, and well being. Ensuring equal, informed, and meaningful participation and leadership of women in decision making processes. Um, and to ensure that resulting decision reflects the needs, interests, and priorities of girls and women, as well as men and boys. Uh, an important component of this new revised and the plan of action is to align the plan with existing international commitments, for example, Agenda 2030 to Gender and Environment Issues, in order to support aligned outcomes. Last but not least, there is a growing commitment to key human rights considerations such as to eliminate gender-based violence in respect to biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. So in summary, through the CBD post-2020 biodiversity framework, we hope we can have far more and broader women organization networking over the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Panela, uh, for taking us through the, the policy level of this issue. Um, it is now time to take a short leg stretcher. And if you haven't by now submitted a question that you want to ask to the panelists, you can do it using Menti. Um, the code, as before, is 47017930, and it's also displayed on the screen. But we will meet back here after the break in two minutes sharp. Ya kaninga ya yuna la 
tu daru ngu amuka ienda ku kaduka wa mulu ngaunu ie umbu ai ka una dala lu kaduka wa ngu nya una na pa ia wa duanda ka ie ka bandi di pieli ima duanda nya So welcome back. I hope you feel refreshed. Maybe you had some tea or coffee and now ready for this, uh, the Q&A session with the panelists. So um, we're going to start with a question uh, that has come from, from the uh, audience. It's a question for Andrew. So if we can have Andrew um, uh, ready to answer a question. Uh, and the question is, what can we do about the gap between theoretical understandings of gender and biodiversity links versus the realities in the field? It is an ocean between academics and women on the ground. So, Andrew, over to you if you'd like to give a short answer to, to this complex question. <laughs> Okay, it seems that we have uh, lost Andrew uh, for the moment, so we will save that question and if he comes back we'll pose it again. Uh, so I will then instead turn to Pragya. And we have a question for you from the audience, Pragya, um, that says, how are women's rights organizations affected by the shrinking space for environmental human rights defenders and CSOs? Pragya, if you'd like to address the question of shrinking civil space. Yeah, hi, thank you for the question. Uh, it is one of the um, issues that AIPB has been advocating um, for the especially indigenous women's organizations um, regarding the shrinking uh, uh, civil space. Yes, it has been affected, especially in the countries like uh, the Philippines, where there's red tagging and the criminalization of indigenous women's human rights defenders. Um, well, you can read uh, you can read a lot of reports and statements that AAPP has uh, stated in the website as well. It has definitely um, impacted very negatively. But we are also hopeful that uh, with the Indigenous Women's Network and the Indigenous Women's Organizations, we will be able to raise issues and amplify our voices as well. Thank you. Thank you, Pragya. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'll turn to Martin next with a question we've received. And uh, the question for you is um, in two parts. Um, has there been any follow-up with the men who participated in the groups that you talked about to reflect on masculinities and the climate crisis to see if there's been any longer term changes in their lives? And are these changes at an individual level and what more can be done to challenge patriarchal structures? Um, yeah. Good Thank question. you, Martin, over to you. Good question. Thank you for that. Um, 
No, there has not been any assessment of the longer term changes. Uh, our article, um, when gender equality and earth care meet, um, is based upon an assessment uh, and interviews with uh, around eight men uh, who's been participating in these se sessions and just after the session had ended. So uh, for now, there's no long-term uh, assessment of the change, uh, but that would be really, really interesting to pursue such research and it's much needed, I would say. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, so still to, to be found out. Um, I would like to turn to uh, Panilla uh, with a question. And uh, the question that has come in is that, what do you see as the main opportunities for moving the agenda on gender equality and biodiversity protection forward uh, within uh, the fora that you are working? So the ways ahead, Panilla, if you could uh, say something about that. Thank you very much. First of all, the important, most importantly, the networks, the civil society networks like Women for Biodiversity, how they are really active and engaged and uh, ensuring to argue for the inclusion of gender issues, gender knowledge, women as agents through all the proposed targets of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. So it should not only be the action plan which I presented, but also that we ensure that all targets are like designed and have indicators that are gender related and that we in the plan as well as the framework ensure that the national biodiversity action action and strategy and action plans will include these elements directly in the, the framework when it's implemented on the ground, because there is many times where it's missing, actually. Uh, you have good global decisions, but then to make them happen, it's really a mm. more yeah. challenging. Thank you. And actually, Panilla, while, while I have you, um, uh, on the line. Uh, we've had actually a couple of people asking uh, what is CBD? So if you could just again repeat the conventional bi biological diversity, what it is, uh, so that we know CBD as, a, as, a, as an abbreviation when it comes up. Yes, the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, has three main goals, which is the protection of biodiversity, conservation, the sustainable use, and the fair and equitable benefit sharing of benefit of its component. So, so this is like the main uh, issue of the Convention on Biological Diversity that in short is the CBD. Thank you, Panela. That should make it, it clear, I hope, that it's, it's the main framework for, for uh, biodiversity issues on, on a global level. So let me turn next to, to Lisa, actually with a, a similar question to the one that, that uh, Pernilla just got. Um, you gave us some examples of how WWF uh, is working to change gender roles in conservation work. So um, in a similar way, what do you see, a, see as the, the main opportunities for, for moving the agenda further, taking the next step um, within the work uh, that you are doing? I think many uh, uh, in WF work on policy level, uh, political level, and I work mainly with uh, our CEDA supported uh, program through CSO partners and communities, uh, as you said, in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. But what we see is that it's very important to, li to link uh, the two. So actually we're starting to work more and make more efforts to get the voices from the communities as I said, up to uh, policy for fora and engage uh, indigenous people, uh, groups, uh, women's organizations and more uh, diverse voices into the policy work and also bring the policy level work and the uh, knowledge of human rights and uh, to communities that need them. So we uh, are uh, working to bridge voices and people. Um, and also I think we have a um, momentum and, and a good opportunity to work 
in uh, countries for this uh, shrinking civic space. All of us who work with environment and conservation and uh, uh, climate issues, because that is usually seen as maybe harmless to work with uh, civil society and strengthen them and give them skills in conservation issues. And that can also be uh, used by the organizations in their work for uh, uh, a more open civil society. So linking and bridging uh, our different expertise uh, in organizations and between our organizations. I think that is what we need to do. Thank you, Lisa, uh, also for, for showing how, how it goes both ways, how you can use environment and biodiversity work as an entry point for, for strengthening rights. So I would like to ask now if we have Andrew with us again, uh, so we can repeat that question. Yes, we do. Wonderful. So I'm going to um, give you a question, uh, Andrew, which has come from the audience. The question is, um, what can we do about the gap between theoretical understandings of gender and biodiversity links versus the realities in the field? Uh, it is an ocean between academics and women on the ground. So, Andrew, if you'd like to give a, a short answer to a complex question. Thank you very much, and apologies for missing you first time round at the end of the break. Um, well, I think the, the key thing here is the links between um, the global and the local level and ways of strengthening action at the local level that need to kind of um, mobilise kind of multiple actors at that level. And that it's a lot easier said than done. Um, but the work that we do, many of the other organisations on this call, um, focuses on getting that grassroots experience uh, reflected um, at various levels, including the negotiations, but including increasing kind of public consciousness of the biodiversity crisis and the grossly inequitable impacts that it has at um, the grassroots level on indigenous peoples um, and on women and you know various kinds of inequity of which gender is obviously a really significant component. Um, so I think there is still a great deal of work to be done in terms of strengthening the, the kinds of grassroots networks that people like Violet have talked about on this call um, and linking those networks with processes such as negotiations and the work that Pernilla talked about as well. Um, and this is kind of long work. There are no easy solutions, but um, it's something that we urgently need to do. Hmm. Thank you, Andrew. That's a, that's a really good answer to a complex question. So thank you for that. Um, we'll take one more question. and. It goes to Violet. So Violet, if you are ready and, and there to respond to a question. Yes, great. Um, the question that has come for you, uh, I'm going to read it here, is can you mention some of the main wild biodiversity wins in the project that you were mentioning? Uh, which are your recommendations to other actors, including the private sector? So actually two questions in, in one there for you, Violet. So over to you. Thank you so much. So uh, some of the wins that I would want to say is um, in the year 2019, when the grassroots women took over rehabilitation of uh, degraded land, we mapped the amount of land that had been degraded in acres. And uh, we committed ourselves to the amount of uh, land that we were going to rehabilitate. So I want to say that in 2019, we were able to rehabilitate 230 acres of land. This is land along the forest, sloppy land, uh, and land that was totally degraded in our community. This happened in uh, Kakamega County. When we looked at these results, we were so excited. And now we expanded each, each farmer, we expanded the amount of acreage that each farmer was going to rehabilitate in their home. So the first one was one acre, each one increased another one acre. So you sustain the first acre and you start again on another acre. And those who began with half an acre again in the same. So each one increased in two. 
And then we also expanded the number of farmers. So the first farmers, we had 112 farmers. The second one, we doubled the number of farmers. We also increased the number of replicating farmers who are going to learn from these role model farmers. So that year we went a very big number. We were able to rehabilitate 630 and that expanded from Kakamega County to another county which we call Homerville. And we covered where I had shown in the pictures, the lake region. The other things that we have done is in Kakamega, we claimed a space of the forest that had been put exotic trees, which were which we all know because we come from this forest, but this was indigenous area, but it had been put down because they wanted to plant commercial trees. So when these trees were harvested, we, we, we rehabilitated, we planted indigenous trees, and we were able to, we have been able to cover up to date 200, not 200, two, two acres and a half of indigenous trees that is called just the, Women forest. That is that is fantastic, Violet. Do you think you could wrap up your your comments? Yes, and I also wanted to just quickly say also soil testing. We have done soil testing because we don't just want to assume that the soil pH is. We do soil testing before we do these activities. We work with companies that do soil testing, and then when we start working on this soil, we test again with these companies. So we are really working close with the private companies that do soil testing and the government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Violet. Uh, it's amazing yeah. to hear about the results that you've achieved. And I'm really sorry, but this is all the questions that we have time for today. Uh, we could have gone on, we had more questions, and you have so much interesting and more to share. But this is uh, what time allows today. So thank you so much to all our panelists and to our keynote speakers for um, presenting and for answering the questions. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn to um, the um, audience again, because we would like to hear from you. So it's time to pick up your phones, go to menti.com again, enter the same code as before. Uh, the code is 4701. 7930. And the question we'd like you to reflect on is what are your key action points or takeaways from today? What are your key action points and or takeaways uh, from today? And we're asking this because it's, it's interesting to hear from those of you listening that what do you take with you? What do you see that you can do in your daily work based on what we've discussed today and what we've talked about? And uh, what, is, what are the main messages that you have picked up from, from today's um, presentations? So the code again, if you need it, is uh, 4701 7930. And we're going to wait a little bit here uh, to see answers coming in. And one thing that is uh, beginning to turn up is the, the need to work with local solutions. And um, there is one message, one takeaway message here on masculinity uh, as the threat to the planet uh, and the need for a new type of masculinity. Uh, we need to work together. Um, we are ne need gender transformative approaches. We need gender sensitive actions are key in addressing biodiversity issues. And um, international development cooperation on gender equality uh, doesn't only lead to increased influence and empowerment for women, but also to more uh, biodiversity, which is good for everybody. That's a, a good takeaway message. Land ownership is coming through and um, the need to take up masculinity work in our gender uh, equality efforts. So many different messages coming up here. Um, I'm gonna mention 
one or more two. Consider masculinity aspects comes up again, working locally and exploring the intersection um, between gender and biodiversity. So thank you everybody for um, sharing your thoughts and for, for having so much to bring with you uh, into your coming work. Um, to round off this seminar now, uh, I'm going to turn to my CEDA colleague Jan van Beck. He is a senior policy specialist on environment and climate change at CEDA with a special responsibility for biodiversity issues. And he will give us concluding remarks on how CEDA sees the way forward. So I hand over to you, Jan. Thank you very much, Anna. And wow, what a day we've had. Uh, so much fantastic work that we heard about and that is being done through so many actors. Uh, during the morning, we have listened to challenges, opportunities and ways forward for addressing root causes of gender inequality and biodiversity loss. And not least learned about the importance of interconnecting programs and actions for promoting gender equality and biodiversity. Many of our speakers has highlighted the importance of listening and involving grassroots and indigenous women in decision-making processes, but also how women see and experience the consequences of biodiversity loss and are taking action through restoring uh, in the example that was given mangrove forest. We've also heard uh, inspiring examples from uh, working uh, uh, and being involved in the processes around the CBD as gender interconnects with other forms of inequalities and discrimination, it is important to continue to have an intersectional approach. Uh, our young participants gave us the sense of urgency of uh, addressing patriarchal and other unequal power relation and the need for transformative and holistic change. And clearly, we at SIDA need to be better at listening to and involving youth in our work as well. So CIDA is also committed to work cross thematically. One concrete example is the recently launched brief on gender equality, environment and climate change. Uh, this brief provides guidelines to, to our program managers on how to assess project proposals, but also in having dialogues with our partner organizations for strengthening the gender perspective uh, in our contributions. And as we've heard during today's seminar, SIDA uh, is already supporting several partners who are promoting biodiversity from a gender perspective and more partnerships uh, are in the pipeline. So although working with bio biodiversity is nothing new at SIDA, uh, we were among the first uh, in the beginning of the 1990s formulating guidances and relating our work to the Convention of uh, Biological Diversity. We cannot live on old merits. And very timely, SIDA uh, has been given an assignment from the Swedish government with a task to strengthen and deepen the work uh, of biodiversity and ecosystems in the agency's total operations. The interlinkages with gender equality and other perspective is an integral part of this assignment. However, it is not only actions for addressing biodiversity loss that needs to have a strong gender equality perspective. Action to promote gender equality also needs to address causes and consequences of biodiversity loss and climate change. On this matter, we've heard how the Beijing Platform on Agenda for Action, adopted uh, over 25 years ago, highlights the need to address the lack of adequate recognition and support for women's contributions to conservation, but also management of natural resources and safeguarding their environment. An action coalition on feminist action for climate justice has been formed as a result of the Beijing plus 25 process. So these are all examples of global multi-stakeholder partnerships for mobilizing governments, civil society, international organizations and the private sector to catalyze collective actions, but also spark conversation across generation, drive investments, and last but not least, deliver results. We at SIDA lead this development talk with so much energy for the work ahead and really look forward to follow up on the comments and questions that many of your participants have given in the Menti and to continue our collaboration with you. So a big thank you to all participants and I hand back over to you, Anna. Thank you, Jan. 
uh, for those concluding remarks. And it should be clear, I think, that CEDA is very committed to continue working with these issues. Now, it's not possible to summarize what we've heard in this very rich seminar today. Um, but it's clear, uh, and I hope it's clear, that CEDA continues to work in close cooperation with partners from local to the global level to address these linkages and these issues. So now, what remains for me is only to thank um, everyone who has contributed today, all of our speakers, and especially you in the audience who have listened and contributed with your input and questions. So let's all keep this discussion going, and most of all, let's get to action. And to stay updated on future development talks at CEDA, keep your eye on CEDA.se and our social media channels. Thank you and goodbye.